station chip reset. Select level. Hey, good morning, Northeast, and a big shout out to those of you joining us online as well this morning. Whether you're on campus or online, you belong here. And we are in week four of our series, Relationship Reset, unpacking what God says about relationships and trying to get back to what he says as opposed to how often we operate in, in our own thoughts, our own minds, with our own strategies. This week, we're going to talk about desires and expectations. Desires and expectations. Whether you recognize it or, or not, we, we all carry with us these God-given desires. The, the God-given desire for love, to be loved. The God-given desire for security. The God-given desire for, for community or even the God-given desire for intimacy. But the trouble in relationship comes when these God-given desires that we carry with us soon become others-focused expectations. These things that God says are good and he places within us, we take and we place on others to fulfill, or we look to them to be the complete fulfillment of these things that Again, rightly given to us by God, but ultimately only perfectly fulfilled by God. And it creates this tension between God-given desires and others-focused expectations. For example, we, we may have a friendship, and we come into the friendship with this God-given desire for connection, which is good and right, and community, which is good and right. But then we place on them these expectations of what that means for them. Like, if you're my friend, then you should respond to my texts right away. And if we're not really close, then I don't understand. Why don't, why don't you call me back right away after I've called you? Like, ignoring the fact that you have children and a job and your own relationships, right? But, but these are my expectations. This is what friendship looks like. Or you go into a marriage and we have this God-given desire for security. Again, it's good and godly, and yet we place it as an other's focus expectation when we say that, man, my security means that we need to have this quality of life, or I really need to be in this kind of neighborhood, and you haven't been able to give me that. Or the God-given desire for intimacy very quickly can become an other's focus expectation of frequency. See, it's in these moments that there is tension in the relationship. All of us enter these relationships with these good and godly things, but the problem is when these others focus expectations aren't met, disappointment ensues, and these unmet expectations result in deep frustrations. I found this tension between desire and expectation is one of the biggest tensions in many relationships. And the good news is that the scriptures actually do speak to it. And when God speaks to it, he doesn't view it just as a relational problem. He views it as actually a spiritual one. And so today we're going to unpack the scriptures and look at what God says about these things and hold it up in light of the gospel in order to find the answer for the things that our souls most crave. So turn with me in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11. If you have a physical Bible in front of you, aim for about halfway in your Bible. If you aim about halfway, you'll likely hit the book of Psalms, one of the largest books, right about the halfway mark in the Bible. And Proverbs comes right after Psalms. So Psalms, Proverbs, then Ecclesiastes. If you have that, pull that up. If not, we'll put it on the screens for you to read. The book of Proverbs, if you're unfamiliar with it, is really a book of wisdom and really wisdom statements. And so it doesn't read like other books. There are a few sections in Proverbs where there's longer sections that are all part of a large thought. But by and large, the majority of the book of Proverbs is small statements. Statements that Hobby Lobby has turned into plaques for our walls, right? But they are tight, compact statements, and yet there's so much to pull out of them. And here in Proverbs 11, verse 23, the Lord speaks to this tension between desire and expectation. It reads, the desire of the righteous ends only in good, the expectation of the wicked in wrath. The desire of the righteous ends only in good, the expectation of the wicked in wrath. Again, it's this statement that comes flying off the page. 
Understand this about Proverbs. Again, Proverbs is a collection of wisdom statements. And really, the theme in Proverbs is, is a contrast. There's always a contrast between two things, or most often a contrast between two things. Really, the book as a whole is a contrast between wisdom and folly. The way of pursuing God and the right way that God would have us live versus the way of the, the flesh, the way we would live. It's a contrast of wisdom and folly. And very often then in the book of Proverbs, this wisdom folly contrast is set in the context of health and unhealth and very often finds itself in a picture of relationship. Wisdom is depicted as health in relationship with others. Folly is often depicted as struggle or conflict with others. And this is exactly what we find here in Proverbs eleven twenty-three. 23. We find a contrast here, wisdom versus folly. A wise way of living versus a foolish way. And here we find then desire is painted in a positive light as wisdom while expectation painted in a negative light as foolish. The desire of the righteous ends in good. The expectation of the wicked in wrath. Now, some of you may be looking at this contrast between desire and expectation. It's like, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I mean, this is his painting expectation in a really bad light, but, but all expectations aren't wicked, right? The expectation of the wicked ends in wrath, but, but all expectation isn't bad, right? And it's not, and so don't misunderstand that. Certainly, the proverb is not saying that all expectations are, are bad. I, I have a certain expectation that my children will obey me. And that's a good thing. Why? Because the scriptures say, children obey your parents. So that expectation is actually rooted in, in something godly. It's not a bad thing. If you're an employer, you probably have a very reasonable expectation that the people you employ will do the things you pay them to do, right? It's not a bad expectation. So really, when we look at this passage, we need to understand that the, the contrast here, the thing that's in tension, is less desire versus expectation, because the true tension that Proverbs is trying to highlight is rather where these things are rooted, what their source are. The contrast is actually a contrast of the heart. Look again at the text. It says the desire of what? Desire of the righteous is in contrast to the expectation of the wicked. Desire is cast as something then that is God-focused. Righteousness being rooted in God, looking to God, God-fearing, God-focused, versus expectation in this context, which is of the wicked. That means it's rooted not in God, but rather its focus is on itself or its focus is others. What Proverbs is contrasting is a life of a person who is focused on God or on others. The desires focused and rightly placed on God's shoulders to bear, where we look for our ultimate security, our ultimate fulfillment, and the only one who can provide all things for us, or we flip that outward and place this ultimate desire and ultimate fulfillment and ultimate satisfaction, ultimate security, we place that burden on someone else to fulfill. What Proverbs is contrasting then is where we place these things matters so incredibly much for our relationships. Desire is cast as someone who is rooting their hope in God. Expectation is cast as someone who is rooting their hope in others. It really then becomes an identity issue. Whether your identity is secure in Jesus or you find your identity in others or the things around you and the things you possess. One is rooted vertically, one is horizontal. If you've been tracking with us at all then in this series and, and tuning into the past several weeks, then I hope that you're making a connection now in the text to conversations that we've been having week in, week out. I'm beating it like a drum, because really what Proverbs is pointing us to is this thing that we've said over and over again, this contrast between whether our eyes are up or our eyes are out. Eyes up, eyes out. The desire of the righteous, those who have their eyes up, is good, but the expectation of the wicked, those who have their eyes out, is going to end in wrath. Eyes up, not out. 
Here's what it looks like and even sounds like in relationships. We get married and we come into this relationship with a good and a God-given desire to be loved. And that desire to be loved can be held and placed at the feet of Jesus. Or that desire to be loved can suddenly, at the altar, when we exchange vows, be placed on someone else. And the minute we place it on someone else, we begin to define what that love looks like. Well, if you really loved me, and all of a sudden the conversation starts to snowball. If you really loved me, you would help with X or Y or Z. If you really loved me, you'd take me out once a week. If you really loved me, it wouldn't be Bill Miller. Right? Like there's, there's certain expectations of what love looks like. And we come in with a God-given desire for love And yet we begin to fill in the details on what that love needs to look like from this person. When my wife and I got married, Don and I, 21 years ago, we we found suddenly tension in our relationship almost every evening over how we locked up our tiny little apartment and got ourselves to bed. And we always seemed to be in tension over this nightly ritual Because she came into the marriage with this God-given desire for security, which is good and right and focused on the right person who can provide true security is great. But in this 600-square-foot apartment, her notion of security was that a husband's job is to go around the house and check every window and every door and make sure everything is set in order to provide security for the family because this is what her daddy did. And they grew up in this big home, right, where he would walk around the home and check everything. And we were now married in this 600-square-foot apartment. And she would get frustrated that I wouldn't get up and check everything because that was the measure of security. And so often we would end up in this tension because unmet expectations always result in frustrations. And the tension was... You haven't checked everything. I was like, I can literally see the door. <laughs> like, the, the deadbolt is locked. I can see it from here. There's, there's only a couple hundred square feet. But no, you need to get up and check. I, on the flip side of this is coming in as a young man with a certain expectation of how intimacy would play out. A good and godly desire for intimacy placed on someone else to fulfill becomes really an expectation of frequency. And so every time I washed the dishes, I thought, yep. Every time I took out the trash, I thought, of course, she's going to love me. I mean, what wife wouldn't gush over a husband who can wash a pot? And suddenly the simple things that I did came with this expectation of some kind of reward. This God-given desire for intimacy became this others-focused expectation where I had defined what that looked like according to my human terms and my human context instead of leaving it in a godly one. See, this is the tension, and what Proverbs is reinforcing here is that when it comes to desire and expectation, the underlying issue is where our eyes are, where our hope is placed. Am I looking to you and placing my hopes and looking at you to be the ultimate fulfillment, or are my eyes rightly fixed on Jesus? And where our hearts are rooted really is the determining factor of whether these things end in good or struggle. So look back at the text with me. The desire of the righteous ends in good. The expectation of the wicked ends in what? Wrath. That's a really strong word. I understand in Hebrew that word wrath means outburst. The expectation of the wicked ends in outburst outburst or outpouring. So let me just pause here and ask a question. For anyone who's been in a relationship, a romantic relationship of any kind, and especially those of you who long-termers, right, have you ever had an outburst over the dishwasher? Have you ever had an outburst over 
the laundry, the trash, the yard, like fill in the blanks. Have you ever had an outburst over the budget? Like, like this, is the, this is the beauty of, of Proverbs, right? Such a simple statement that has so many points of connection. The reality is when we have these desires that are good and godly, but we place them on others as others focus expectations, it ends up in some kind of conflict and frustration because you haven't done the thing that I thought you would do in the way that I thought you would do it because that's how my mama or my daddy used to do it. And that's what love looks like. And when love in our relationship doesn't look like love in our minds, it ends up being an outburst. And we end up saying things like this, but... But you should know by now. I shouldn't have to tell you. If you love me, then you should just know. And we get these points of tension and these moments of expectation. There are these moments where how we spend money becomes an outburst. You want to spend, I want to save. When expectations are carried into marriage, there's outbursts all over the place. You don't talk to me enough. Well, you don't touch me enough. Well, you don't take me out enough. Expectations frequently lead to these outbursts because when they're not kept within their proper place and proper perspective, it blows up. And it's not just that expectations can become frustrations and lead to these outbursts. It's that expectations lead to a lack of appreciation, practically speaking, expectations lead to a lack of appreciation. This is often where the frustration comes and the outbursts come. Here's why I say that. If I have an expectation on someone to do something and they do it, I'm not going to gush all over them for that because all they've done is met the bare minimum. Like if this is my expect, if a husband is just is supposed to take out the trash and that's what husbands do, then I'm not going to applaud you for it. Because that's what husbands do. You're just doing your job. If the expectation is that the wife always cooks the meals or the wife always does the shopping and the laundry and the cleaning while working a job, right? If that's the expectation, then she's never going to get a compliment. She's never going to be appreciated for it because she's just doing what she's supposed to do. This is why expectation leads to wrath. This is why it ends up in outbursts, because expectation leads to really a lack of appreciation. Very rarely do we show gratitude to people who are just doing what we've expected, what we think that they should. The Proverbs is saying, when our desires are fixed in the right way, in the right person, the desire of the righteous, God-focused, they end in good. Really, the, the Lord helps us see the good in all things and even in all people. Whereas when our focus is always on others, we're always judging them based by standards and performance. So this is the, the landscape, right? The question is, what do we do with it? What, what, what's the takeaway? There's some real practical takeaways to this proverb and to this conversation. And I want to highlight a few practical things, but then ultimately I want to focus us back on Jesus and the gospel. Practically speaking, what do we do? Well, first... We need to understand unspoken expectations will always be unmet expectations. It's one of the very first things that my wife and I had to wrestle through in our relationship. Like unspoken expectations are always going to be unmet expectations, and unmet expectations will always be a cause for frustration, right? And yet so often, part of the problem is we come and we have these things buried in our hearts, and we're not speaking them out of our mouths. In fact, very often we don't even realize what our expectation is. We can't even verbalize it to ourselves, but we certainly are looking to this other person to perform in a certain way. And unspoken expectations will always lead to unmet expectations. We think we've been clear, but they're still not doing what we want. It ends up with a statement, well, if they really loved me, if you really cared about me, I shouldn't have to tell you this again. We've, we've been married for a whole year by now. You know me. You know what I like, right? Here's the thing on this. First of all, when you got married, or even if you're not married yet, this, this person that you're dating, even if you're not dating, your boss, your family, whoever it is in your life, let's just acknowledge something. That person isn't psychic. 
like, one of the big eurekas for me was realizing that just because my wife loves me doesn't mean she knows what I'm thinking all of the time. Like, I didn't marry a psychic. If that word offends you, forgive me. Let's just put it in, in more spiritual language then. I didn't marry someone who's omniscient. And I cannot expect an imperfect person I'm in relationship with to bear a trait that only God can possess. I can't expect that of my coworkers. I can't expect that of my spouse. It's a sin to put an expectation on this other person that they will know what you're thinking and they should know what you like and they will fulfill that for you. Only Jesus can do that. And so we have to invest in communication. We have to speak it out because unspoken expectations will always be unmet. By the way, the truest measure of love in a relationship is not whether the person is able to read your mind and do what you think they should do. The truest measure of love in a relationship, according to Jesus, is laying down your life even when the other person doesn't deserve it. And even when you don't feel like it. Secondly, we must assume the best and show them the same grace that they want or that we want them to show us. The, the way to battle between the tension of desires and expectations is first to assume the best and then show them the same grace that we want them to show us. If you're having conflict because the other person hasn't met your expectations, don't assume it's because they don't care. Don't assume it's because they don't love you. And yet so often this is the dialogue that goes on in our heads. Like, you haven't been doing this thing. You don't care about me. You, you don't call me back right away. Clearly I'm not important to you. Or I was in a meeting, maybe, Right, But, but we, we get these thoughts in our heads and we don't assume the best of the other person. This goes back to something else that we've said in this series. Like we, we have to live in our relationships and commit to each other and say to each other regularly, hey, I'm on your team. I'm not out to get you. I'm not out to hurt you. And I have to assume the best of my spouse when many times expectations aren't met. And then I need to deliver to her and show her the same grace that I would want her to show me. Because here's the funny thing. When I don't measure up to her expectations and that becomes an outburst in our relationship, I very much expect grace. I very much want grace from her. Because like, hey, I've, I've been busy. Do you know what I've been dealing with? The kids were screaming at the time. Email was chiming. There was a, a, a massive, you know, blow up at work that I've been dealing with. Like, like cut me some slack. And yet so often when the roles are reversed, I'm not really interested in cutting slack. I'm interested in her doing what I need her to do, what I think she should do. So often in these relationships, we want grace when we fail, but we struggle to show it when the other person has failed us. When our eyes are fixed on Jesus, though, when our eyes are upward, it's a totally different story. And so this goes back then to the gospel. What would Proverbs have us do? How should we live in light of the gospel? What the gospel would have us do is lay every desire at the right feet, the feet of Jesus. The desires of the righteous, those who have their eyes fixed on God, end in good. The desires of the righteous end only in good. The gospel tells us that really only God can truly satisfy our soul. That, that all of the things that are wrong in the world and all of the things that bring angst in our lives and our hearts, these things are deeply rooted in a sin issue, not just relationship issues. People are broken just as we are broken. I, myself, am broken. I'm constantly failing to live up to others' expectations, even the best of them, because I fail. I fall short of the glory of God. And others are constantly failing to meet my expectations. 
And if my life has been rooted with an identity in my kids or in my marriage or in my work, where I'm expecting those things to be my fulfillment, I will always end up dissatisfied because only Jesus can satisfy. The gospel would have us then lay every burden, lay every hope, lay every desire at the feet of Jesus. And Proverbs then is pointing us to lay it before him. Psalm 62, verses 5 through 8 say this. For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence. For my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory, my right, or my mighty rock. My refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him, for your God is a refuge for you. The scriptures would call our burdens, our hopes, our desires, our everything to be placed at the feet of Jesus. And God calls us then to love others, not with our eyes fixed on them, but to love and serve others with our eyes fixed on Jesus. That's why Jesus even said in Luke chapter 6 verse 35, uh, this of even our enemies, love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be the sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Jesus is turning our eyes upward, place all of these things upward. We are to love others, serve others, even lend to others, those that we would even consider our enemy, without any expectation on them, but instead with all our hopes and desires rightly fixed on him. And Jesus says, if this is how we're to treat our enemies, then there's this implication in the text, how much more should this then be how I treat my spouse? If I would love and serve and even lend to my enemy without expectation in return, how much more should I love and serve and give to my spouse without expectation of anything in return? Trusting instead that God knows, God sees, God alone can provide. We need to lay everything then at the feet of Jesus. We say to the people that we are engaged in relationship with, I am going to love you, but I am going to put my burdens on him. I am going to honor you, but I am placing all of my desires on him. I am going to exchange my vows with you, but only God has the ability to perfectly satisfy my soul. See, so often when we come into a relationship, and especially a marriage, we make vows to a picture in our head, and then we get frustrated with the person in real life. And the scriptures would say, no, we make a vow to a real person who is imperfect, but we place all of our hope and desire on the only one who can sustain it, the only one who can carry it. I don't know how this strikes you. I don't know what hopes and desires that you've been holding on to and what's maybe an outburst in your relationship or not, but I do know that there is one who can rightly sustain you. Maybe you've placed hopes and desires and they've become expectations on your kids. When they go off to college, they are going to call every week. They're going to want to spend time on the phone with mama, right? And maybe you found that after they've gone off to school, they've kind of forgotten about you. In the first semester, there was frequent phone calls and then semester two, semester three, and now you're like texting them your phone number just to make sure that it's still in their phone, right? Uh, so often, desire and expectation looks in a very particular fashion when it's placed outward on others. And maybe those are things today that you need to surrender to Jesus. Family expectations. Maybe there's an, an expectation even that you have of your spouse 
There's been a good that you've been investing in the relationship, but it hasn't been returned to you in the way that you envisioned, in the, in the specific way that you thought it would be repaid to you. And it's created this tension between you, not because your spouse is a bad person, but simply because you had a picture they could not meet. Would you take that picture to Jesus? Maybe it's happened at work. Maybe it's even happened in the church. What a year of expectation we've had. Expectation and hope and desire placed on candidates and, and politics, only to find around every turn they simply cannot sustain and satisfy. So in the midst of this, might we just humbly come back to Jesus? As we've said time and time again in this series, and I'm just going to keep repeating, because our souls need to hear the gospel over and over and over again, that only God can sustain, only God can satisfy. And so whatever it is that you're wrestling with, would you place that now before the Lord? Would you come before him and would you surrender that to him? Father God, we come before you. We just acknowledge, Father, how quickly our eyes turn outward. We acknowledge, God, the tension in our hearts between these good things that you placed in us, a desire for community or, or intimacy, and how often, God, we expect others to meet that in the fullest sense. And we confess that for what it is, God. It's idolatry. It's expecting something of a thing or of a, of a person that really only you can fully provide. So help us, Father, to think rightly of others. Help us, Father, to keep you first and foremost in our hearts and our minds. Teach us, Father, to work through the tensions in these things. Give us courage, Father, to speak into them, to talk through the, the difficult moments of frustration. But in that, Father, may we continue to humble ourselves before you and surrender to you the things that we are holding on to in our hearts. Father, most of all, we come before you and acknowledge that in Jesus Christ, Father, you provided what we needed most. And so we thank you for a perfect lamb given for us, for the perfect sacrifice of our sin to redeem us. And we choose again to trust and hope alone in you. And we pray all of this in Jesus' matchless name.